Yeah, hi. Um, good day, good evening, whatever, good morning to all of you. Uh, we have along with me today uh, Nishvita, who is in place of Magda. I don't know if I've seen the name Magda, it's not Magda. Um, uh, many of you have seen Nishvita before on this panel. She helps us with all uh, programs, marketing, and everything. Uh, she is also barely 24, I think. I'm not quite sure, but uh, heavily engaged in uplift of adolescent boys and girls and tremendous passion to what she's doing. And in some way, <clears throat> we would connect some of those things that uh, someone like her is doing to what we talk about in Create Your Future. Betty is someone that I met just a week ago, a friend of Magda, who is as different from me as can be. She's young, she's a woman, she is from a different culture. So deliberately, possibly Magda chose me, a muse who would be very, very different and not share any preconceptions that I have. And um, I went through this process uh, for just two sessions with her, about roughly an hour each. So she would be able to share with you as we go along in some of the process work uh, as to what her experiences are to give you a better idea about how that works, what problems you may undergo. Uh, with that, I stop here now. Um, I think Nishmita would have posted you or would post you uh, the link to the PDF as well as the meditation exercise, which you might like to go through later today, <clears throat> tomorrow, so that when you come back on Wednesday, you have some idea about what we are talking about and perhaps you might have practiced some of it. So I don't want to go too deep into it. And Please excuse me if I do not answer <clears throat> any questions which are cognitive. Um, and if you have any of those in terms of seeking explanation, what this means, what it's, does it mean existentially, philosophically, cognitively, blah, 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 please post them on the forum. I'll try my best to answer. Unless it's a genuine plea for help. Look, I don't understand a darn thing about what you're talking about. Sure, I'll leave it to Nishmita to uh, take a look at it and then let me know so I might answer. Otherwise, uh, very unlikely that I would be able to do that because I think my biggest challenge today, our biggest challenge is going to be in terms of time. Uh, so let me <coughs> start with this. Uh, in the great Hindu epic, the Mahabharata, Yudhishthira, the prince of the Pandavas, was once asked this question by a spirit. What is the strangest thing that you have experienced and you are experiencing? To which, which Yudhishthira is supposed to have replied, I see around me people dying every day, every second, every minute. And I see many other people seeing that happen. And in spite of it, pretty much everybody wants to be immortal. They don't want to die. They believe there is some way that they will find that they will live on. It's an extremely powerfully existential question and answer, which has been repeated by many great Hindu philosophers over the years. And what I want to link there with you, unlike what it is normally linked to about life and death, something much more prosaic, much more daily in terms of what our wants and needs are. Most of us, in my own personal experience and experience of many that I have worked with, probably 10,000 or more during my corporate career and later journey in trying to understand who I was myself, operate from the space of wants. Wants can never be fulfilled. Wants are greed, they multiply, and in turn result in frustration, anxiety, helplessness, sorrow, what the Buddha said life is sorrow, he meant the wants of life are sorrow, dukkha, because they create discontent, which in turn creates a whole new host of other things. This universe, however you want to interpret that, can fulfill the needs of billions and billions of people, but it cannot fulfill the want of even one single person. The greed of one person could be greater than all that this universe can perceive or provide. I want to go into some detail about this. I see this not so much as a complete differentiation, but I see it as a polarity. We will always be in this wants and needs. And it's our ability to move to the extent possible to the needs and integrate the two polarities into what our core needs are is pretty much what this process of create your new future uh, is about. 
my wife is listening to this, so I'll be on my best behavior. But at the same time, I just would like to, in a sense, dedicate this process to her because without her help, uh, her wisdom, it would have been impossible for me to have arrived at certain of the things that I did and not do some of the things that I was doing. I would like to start with something more subtle than what wants and needs are. The concept of potentiality and actuality that I have talked about before. We as humans are all pretty much divine. We are spiritual. We have the potential of infinite possibilities, unlimited potential. Unlike practically every other species on Earth, the Homo sapiens do not follow the code of nature. Every other species eats when it's hungry, hunts when it's hungry, mates when it needs to reproduce and nature dictates it. Many other things, they are coded within them. They follow a nature's code, whatever that code is for that species. We call that a dharma in the Hindu philosophy. Whereas the humans either have broken the code or forgotten the code. We have rewritten the code. After all, we are all great software engineers. And while rewriting the code, we have completely forgotten the basics of what we are here for. What did this nature, what did this universe intend us to be? As a result, while we have all this infinite potential, our actualization, our actuality of this potential is unfortunately very, very limited and often tragic. So we create as much destruction or more destruction than we create. And many other things happen as a result. And the major polarity that we need to really look at is how do we rediscover this code of nature, the dharma, that is within us, that nature intended us to be. What am I here for? Who am I? What's my purpose? What's my meaning? Stuff like that. So that we really are able to put our infinite potential of unlimited possibilities to actualize what we really need rather than what we really want. The Hindu philosophy, there's a concept called karma. Many of you know that, you know, know the word. Within the karma, not many of you may know, there is a concept called the prarabdha, P-R-A-R-A-B-D-E-B-D-A. Some of you who are familiar with that know the term, please post it for others who don't, you can Google that. The prarabdha karma. Krishna and the Bhagavad Gita says that we, come into this world wearing a set of clothes as our body and mind. And when we die, all that happens is that we leave those clothes behind. However, we carry with us a very subtle sheath. You might call it an overgarment, you might call it whatever you want. He calls it the vasana, the subtle essence of the desires and the fears that we have experienced through this life, which are unfulfilled. And we still want to fulfill them. And we leave with that wherever we go as an energy and we come back into this life because of that unfulfilled desires and fears to continue the cycle of life and birth in another set of clothes, in other body and mind. So deep within us, there is a code, there is a prarabdha. And it's real, believe me. But you don't realize what it is. There are processes how you discover that. In the workshops that we do, uh, that I've conducted several in the past and once in a while I do now, and hopefully if there is sufficient interest, I might do that after these programs next year. I use several techniques, many of them modern and scientific, from Maslow's hierarchy, which is really not hierarchy of needs, but hierarchy of wants, to Graves levels of consciousness, some people refer to as spiral dynamics, Dill's neurological levels, Jungian 
stuff on archetypes, dreams, and so on and so forth. Some neurobiological, neurosciences, molecular biological research in the near future, near past, about quantum physics and so on. But a lot of the Hindu philosophy and scriptures, Upanishads, and one of them is a meditation called the Trataka, T R A T A K A. And if any of you know the word, just post it out there. It is a Buddhist meditation technique, uh, Tibetan Buddhist meditation technique, which is about looking at a flame of a lamp, preferably one which is made out of the liquid butter of cow's milk, as it were, which I have done for many, many times and taken many people through, activating your third eye, as it were, and which gives you an inkling of what your prarabdha is. And once you realize what your prarabdha is, the code comes into much clearer focus and you start working on that. So basically these two polarities in terms of integrating wants with needs and your actuality with your potentiality in terms of understanding more about what your prarabdha is in terms of your purpose and meaning and so on and so forth, is what the whole process of creative future is based on. And it's also a transformational process. Many people in the past have asked what's the difference between transaction and transformation. Transaction is, as the word implies, trans means across, action. We either repeat the same action again and again, trying to expect another outcome, which is madness, or we do different actions to arrive at that outcome, which very often doesn't work because we don't understand why we are doing it. And instead, transformation, we really work towards changing that basic form of who we are our mind and body, our behavior, our mindset, our core, our needs rather than wants. And in that process, sometimes it's pretty painful and sometimes create your future it can be a painful process. You die in a sense. Your ego has to die, your emotions have to die, your memories have to die and you recreate yourself. It's a process of rebirth. So this, this is a third polarity in terms of transformation and transaction and a few other polarities that we would be going through in this process is whatever I'm telling you now is pure knowledge and in many ways it's just garbage related through one year and through the other you may say oh I will remember this you don't unless immediately after this program or the next day or two you really seriously reflect on it listen to it probably again and see what happens within you and apply it and then reflect and then refine and apply. The continuous process of moving from that knowledge into applied actuality is what creates wisdom. And that's the only thing that matters. And in order to do that, your cognition, all your fantastic, wonderful thinking capabilities are of absolutely no use. They are actually blocks. You need to move from the cognitive thinking to a stillness of mind where you're able to just witness, observe what is happening around you and move forward with it. And finally, you move from a sensory mindful state, which is necessary for specific action at a point in time to something which is mindless, which is just observing, witnessing, and it's standing the being state rather than the doing and the having state. So these are some of the polarities and I would be taking you through several steps. The first one is um, the meditation process, which you have in a podcast. Some of you have attended this with me today. Please go through that in the link. To, in the next session on Wednesday, I will try and take you through in greater detail that meditation technique. That's one. The second is I'll now start with a process which helps you to understand in this session in a much simpler way than the one that I do in the workshops as to what could perhaps be that purpose and meaning in your life by going through a process that I call the joyful or the feel-good index. And from there, develop a kind of an ikigai, a sweet success spot, which puts together the purpose, the strengths, the opportunities, and what resources you need into a whole to create a kind of a business plan for yourself, for your work life in the next few years, maybe within three to five years. These three, I'll try and cover as much as I can today and leave you with 
something which is truly transformation for you to do overnight for the Wednesday session, which is about looking beyond 20, 25 years from now. What is it that you wish to be moving from the state of want into need? And then once you've created that vision, compare it with what is it that you wanted to do initially in the next three to five years and see what the gaps are. And I'll take you through a process in the next session to understand the implications of this gap. What emotions come up for you? How do you cleanse yourself? How do you heal yourself? How do you get rid of the negative beliefs within you? And then create a kind of a streaming intent, a movie which moves from the want to the need, from the near-term bonds to the long-term needs and take you through a meditative process. So this is overall the total process, the entire process in some simplistic ways expressed in the deck, which has been shared with you. Uh, I know it's insufficient. That's the best that I can do in a webinar of this type. Uh, over the next several weeks, uh, months, we can cover these in advanced webinars if you have any questions to add. Next year, I hope to run detailed uh, mastery webinars on the subject to train people who are interested in becoming trainers in this space. And unfortunately, given the reality of situations, it'll have to be paid and probably some face-to-face -face ones as well. So let me start today with the first step. What I want to do today is what I would call the understanding the joyful index or the feel-good index. I took Betty through this and I'll just ask her to come back and tell me. Essentially, what I want you to do is this. If you have a piece of paper and if you don't have in your own mind, draw a horizontal line and go back to the time as far back as you can when your memories existed. Maybe the age of three or if you have been extremely precocious, maybe the age of one. From that time, over the years, every year, every five years or whatever you can to where you are today, what are those things which really gave you tremendous sense of joy, achievement? Or if not happiness, at least calmness, where you felt very peaceful. For example, I always, when I think about this joyful index, I remember Wordsworth's poem, The Daffodils, where he says, it flashed upon my inward eye, that bliss of solitude when he looked at the daffodils, or Van Gogh looked at the sunflowers and he painted his pictures, or great artists with the music and dance and so on and so forth, how they are able to express a tremendous sense of joy that they have, or peace, or calmness, or whatever it is. So plot that in a way, you may not be able to do it now in the next few minutes, but if not over the night, over tomorrow, do this sincerely, what is it that really created that sense of joy, fulfillment, content, calmness, peace? Is it something to do with achievement of wealth or power? Is it about doing something which doesn't matter if nobody recognizes it, nothing happened, but I still very, felt very happy within? Or is it just enjoying nature, just looking at something that makes me feel wonderful? And you would find that there is a connection, there is a thread that is happening in these things that you have noted. If you have noted down 20 or 30 points, and you will feel a connecting thread that is happening. And that thread gives you a reasonably good indication what that code is for you. What is that inner prarabdha? What is that inner purpose, inner meaning? It may not be that very clear, for very few people, it'll be very clear with a simplistic exercise, but it'll give you at least a reasonably good idea of where you're heading. So that is the first step. Now, let me stop here at this moment, and I want to ask Betty. I went through with Betty one session, and she came back and told me, no, nada, doesn't work. And then <laughs> we went through a second exercise. Uh, and um, so I, I have no idea what she's coming up with now. Betty, would you like to share what your experience of doing this joyful or feel-good index is? And actually, I went into the exercise actually rather worried that the sometimes the my 
what I express is much more mild. And I was worried that part of the reason why um, I'm glad to be part of this is there is a need, there is something unsatisfied in me that's made me a little bit numb. But what I found and actually in going through it starts with some things very small, the, the peaceful moments. And that I think really helped me start seeing my threads, which for me are the relationships, my family, or the peaceful moments of, for me, happen to be looking at nature, flowers, enjoying walks. And what was, I think, um, in going through it, then I added to my, my joyful index a second time. Um, I started looking at some opportunities that I did not consider before. For my family, it's very much um, just looking at not necessarily careers, but just seeing other things. And I did find it motivating to then start identifying other, seeing other connections, things that maybe I was restricting myself because I wanted to look at within my current scope, within my current environment, starting to look outside. So it was um, something that I, I enjoyed. And actually um, this past weekend, usually my Saturdays when it's my one day where my afternoon is just my alone time, I spend a lot of it doing very little. Um, but instead I found that I was found that I was doing something different. I changed my routine and um, and then changed my actions by going through even in two exercises. And I think I'm going to be going back and adding more to it. And it's those, and then not feeling guilty that um, it's maybe smart starting smaller. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, so it's been, I think it'll be like trickles of water, but I think it's very, for me, it's very empowering and I don't have as much ex experience necessarily as some of you with them. Um, the the Hindu beliefs, but I think it's something that I think anybody can, can connect with at different moments in their life. And I I think it's starts with something small. Um pictures with family and with for me it's also you know moments of remembering those that may not be with me anymore, but remembering those relationships and yeah, so it's it's a very I think a very empowering exercise. And it's okay to take it slow and I appreciate that. Thanks, Billy. Um, there was a great philosopher saint in India, Ramakrishna. Uh, he used to worship this form of deity, which is terrifying, called Kali, who is basically, in some senses, uh, a killer. And there was this lady um, who came to him and he said, uh, meditate upon the Kali. She said, no way. I shudder, there's something that I cannot do. So he says, not to worry. Is there anybody that you truly love whose memories really make you feel whole, connected, content? He said, yeah, there's this little nephew of mine and uh, I love him a lot. He said, just focus your attention on him and meditate upon him and then come back after two weeks. And she came back after two weeks and said, when I was able to do that, I gradually felt that it's no longer that my love and compassion and care was limited to him, but expanded beyond that. And now I'm able to look upon this fearful, terrorizing image of Kali and still be able to see what is beyond that. So that is how it starts and what you said. It may be very simple thing. Somebody has posted here in terms of relationship, playing with my baby brother and so on and so forth. So, that, how does it translate into something much larger in terms of our connection with the rest of the world? Is that what we are really coded in rather than uh, pursuit of wealth and power, which is what, like, for instance, a large part of my life that I was completely focused on exclusion of others. And the more I achieved them, the more I find I wanted more. It was never ending. And finally, it did end in, ended in several traumatic events and finally, I had the realization that I need to completely relook at my life and reframe my life. It's not bad to seek wealth and power. Certainly, they are a very necessary part of our existence, our day-to-day -day existence. However, if that is to the exclusion of several other things in our lives, such as relationship and health and so on and so forth, 
then we are really quoting disaster. And, and that is not really the natural code that has been set up for ourselves. So what, what I would like to leave with you is it may seem very simplistic to you. Is it going to lead anywhere? I promise you it will. I have worked with literally thousands and thousands of people on this and it does work. Start with a simple step of plotting your joyful experiences or calming influences or feel good experiences or experiences where you feel in control and so on and so forth over the years from as long as you can remember and see what are the different connects that are coming. And those connects are really what is going to make you happy. The simple principle is that which makes you happy when you engage in fully makes you skillful, make you powerful, and you do better and better on it, and it'll make you successful. If you don't have that passion, just from cognitive brilliance, if you try to do something, you're going to falter sometime, someplace. And you're not going to be happy. You're not going to make other people happy. It's a very, very simple principle. So I would like you to take that. This is the first step. Unfortunately, I do not have really the time. I normally spend half a day on this process, but here we are spending a few minutes. The next is, call it what you will. You call it the purpose, the passion, or whatever else it is. Let me just... Uh, put this chart uh, and share screen with you so that, yeah, Betty, you are able to see this? Yes. Yeah, thank you. So this is, yeah, many of you are familiar with this fashionable word called Ikigai, which has been rediscovered, rediscovered many people because that's a new age word. We call it the sweet sort of success. You start with what you discovered in the joyful index as the potential or the passion, which indicates your potentiality as well as the passion, the code to lead to that potentiality in a sense, your prarabha. In another circle by its side, whichever way you want to do it, put down another circle overlapping with it, which indicates the strengths that you've had, that you've displayed in terms of achieving whatever you have achieved. Like I know Bitti, um, works in certain spaces and she has tremendous strengths in achieving that. She manages a number of people and each one of you have your own strengths. And if you still have some doubts about it, you can go to a very, very simple online free tool called Richard Step, R-A-C-H-A-R-D-S-T-E-P, richardstep.com. Give you a simple strength finder, which doesn't cost you any money unlike Gallup. And it'll give you a reasonably good idea of what your strengths are, even if you are not fully conscious about them. Combining these two, you can discover opportunities or possibilities where when they come together, you would be able to do something with it. For instance, when I went through this exercise, even I was not fully aware, maybe consciously I was not aware, I discovered, this was several years ago, um, I was in my late 50s, that's why my son named it Coach, uh, 65, the next slide, the next exercise that we do is 65 back. And I found that helping people to learn was something which was passion for me. Uh, I was a teacher not because I like teaching, though I do, and I like to hear my own voice, less and less uh, as life goes on. But the helping people to learn was very, very important for me. And that, that, in a sense, was a passion. And I was able to do it earlier in my management career, various other things. I was also teach, teaching meditation because I was in a spiritual path parallelly. And then when I became a coach, I got myself trained as a coach. And I find this was a fantastic way of how, in a very, very different way, facilitation, helping people to learn. And so I was able to combine these two. And Kocharya was the actuality. Uh, be it in the coaching space or the coaching training space or various other spaces, how to help people learn some of these things. And so that's a simple example I would like to describe for you. And the last one is in order to make that opportunity a real actuality, what are the things that you need? What are the supporting systems that you need? It could be about creating a network, it could be creating an eco structure, it could be about 
more learning, learning more skills and so on and so forth. And we will go into it in the next slide when I'll describe to you what is called a growth wheel, putting it together almost like a business plan. And then you have something which helps you use it as a three to five year term. Don't ask me, can I do it for two years? If you want to, please do. Generally three to five years in this term. What is it that you really can achieve, would like to achieve, how do I go about it? It's like a near term business plan for yourself. So these two will take a last bit. Before that, there was something, somebody has asked me, can you give me an example, what you want to do with this plotting? I don't want you to do anything, please. I just want you to try and discover what your inner passion is in whatever way. If this exercise doesn't work, if something else works, do that. Simplest way that I found that it works is if you go back and reflect on what are the things that made you happy in your experience, Betty explained this, that looking at pictures, memories, looking at what is outside, enjoying life, these made her happy. And if that is one of the threads that is coming through, that is one of your meanings and purposes in life, which will make you happy. Maybe there is something else that is coming up. Maybe what you've always been very, very happy about Choice about is making money, then your prarabdha is to make money. That's perfectly okay. Maybe being powerful, being controlling other people is your prarabdha. That is fine, okay too. And later we can discover how it can be combined with other stuff. So whatever that happens by plotting these joyful mm -hmm. events or things which made you feel really good, feel good events, and try and find some threads connecting dots, what happens? That is really what uh, you might like to do, uh, if you can understand that. I don't know whether I, I can do anything better than that uh, as of now. So um, yeah, so Betty, now I'll, I'll stop scaring, uh, sharing screen. I would like you to tell me a little bit about what is the experience that you went through when you went through this sweet spot success, sweet success spot, Ikigai, and the growth wheel. Uh, I'll just put on, put on the uh, growth wheel, just one second. Let me uh, take the next slide, uh, just so that people understand what it is. Da, da, da. Yeah, sorry about that. Yeah, this is the growth wheel. Um, it is a simple business plan. Most of you who are in the executive space or any space where you're doing some work would understand this. Come, arising out of that Ikigai, the sweet success spot, what is your unique selling proposition? What is the value that other people can see in you? What is the audience to whom you would like to work with? What is it that you need to develop your skill as? The 40% means at this point in time, I already have 40%, it's just an explanation. What are the behavioral needs that you need to work on networking, financial support if you need. Like when I started Kochari, I clearly decided it's going to be a brick and mortar, mom and pop kind of stuff. I would spend what I have. I'll never look for other stuff outside, but it may not be the case with everybody. And how do I still integrate my work and life? I do not get obsessed with what I had before, uh, move more towards the needs than the wants, though it may not be completely needs. Uh, the ecosystem development, how would I contribute to the system around me? Uh, these are the kind of things that uh, I would like to look at. And this is like a short-term goal in the next about three to five years, based on the code that I have discovered for myself may work for me better than stuff that has worked before. What is it that I can develop? So I'll move to Betty now for her feedback. Yeah. yeah. And um, to be to be frank, I think the the sweet the sweet spot and grow, going towards my 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 growth wheel for three to five years. The first time I first round going through it was intimidating. I don't have a business plan for what I want or um, what I how I envision my life. It's not clear, um, but I really enjoyed going through the the mind and body awareness meditation. I think it took maybe two to maybe the third time where I started to feel more and more empowered and it was hard for me to see more actionable patterns initially um but then i think by the after the second time i went through the meditation i started 
doing things, <laughs> just um, it, and um, you know, cleaning up, tidying up in the house, or the work meetings. That you know, the outcome wasn't wasn't what I wanted it to be. Um, but working with develop with my team to say, okay, let's look at another way. Something that was powerful in going through these um, the Swiss finding the opportunity. What are the actionable things? Those are those are things that's important to me. How can I en enable myself to do something to change the situation at work, at home, to have more positives in my life, but also helping my team see that. Um, so not thinking about, I don't want this, but really framing it as, okay. Um, for example, one of the things we're doing is um, we're, we're hiring more, more managers. Okay. But feeling frustrated. Okay. We haven't found the right person yet, but I think we have a better understanding of who we want. And also we're going to, we will find this person and it's going to be a fantastic um, um, manager for, for this area and helping the team see that. So a lot of it for me was, okay, that's something I want in my growth wheel. And in, and knowing that it's going to be three to five years, having that a better defined for in the, my work contacts for trans, um, succession planning, but also coaching my team to develop that. And then that was an, my small spoke of my wheel that I was able to start laying out actions. And once I started those motions, um, then it allowed me to look at, okay, better putting to words something that was, what is Betty, what's my unique selling position. And uh, I think it allowed me to feel in other spokes of my wheel um, starting to better put things into words. So again, it's, I think that consistent thing for me is it's okay to start small and then working, not necessarily knowing what my end vision, my, the, my final um, path is, but it's that process of going through it, the journey of going through these exercises and then being patient with it to see how it, how it grows and fill in the other areas. Um, so that for me then allow me to see more intersections. Um, I don't have a, a clear picture of my guy, but it has allowed me to fill in more spokes of my my growth sheet. So that was been that's been kind of the my my process and it's going through it, filling it a little bit at a time. And I do find that mornings are best for me. I'm not a morning person, but I do. I, what I've been doing is listening to the meditation in the morning, feeling some of the, trying to envision that, that light, the energy, and then becoming not so trapped in my thinking process is what I, a checklist of what I need to get done, but just generally feeling calm and ready. I think that deep breath to go on to the next step, whether it's my exercises or tackling a project at work. So that's, that's where I'm at. <laughs> Great. Very, since we have had just two sessions of roughly about an hour each. Okay. Um, I didn't know you, know you from before. We haven't had any follow-up sessions. Now, in what way, despite the fact that the first time around you really had uh, doubts about what to do with the Joyful Index as well as with the Ikigai, how were you able to link that what you found was something that resonated for you, made you happy, into creating that ikigai kind of picture and then move into the growth wheel. How did that sort of segue from one to another? For me, it was, um, so to, to share with, um, I don't, I started with, actually I started by reflecting, like one of my, my patterns is I, I need to be with more people. And um, the, it's the, the interactions that help is something that I need, even though oftentimes when I'm down or if, if it's been a bad day, I say, okay, I've had enough of dealing with HR or dealing with people. But knowing that, seeing that, because it was, I was honestly surprised how often people and in interactions and um, relationships came up in my, my um, joyful index. So then taking that to think, okay, that's okay. How can I, what's the one thing I can do at work right now to give me more of that? So I started with, okay, now let me put it in the context of these projects at work with these people. Um, and 
that allowed me then to put it into into words and then putting into my grow sheet um not because i can't it also inspired personal goals as goals such as learning languages or um what will allow me to travel and what are then then go circle back to um there are times in my life i found that i've gone through cycles where i feel guilty <laughs> about um or wanting to disconnect from the more financial things but there are things that I want to do, um, such as an interest in nature, environment, and preservation efforts that requires um, money and requires the certain level of wealth to be able to support those efforts. So then saying that it's okay, um, I notice that in myself and I have strength that will allow me to, to do that and then circling back. So start for again, starting small, starting one area, what are things that, and then it does trigger, it It brings my attention to other things and then circling back to the specifics and then putting them, I've, and I, I think, I hope that the attendees will find the, um, once you really sit down and print out the PDFs or write down and visualize those circles, filling them in one bit at a time, um, that I think is just putting it down and then coming back to it. Um, it's not necessarily a transform. Um, I didn't expect you know, huge changes right away, but I've been really happy with being able to fill it in, you know, trickles at a time and um, feeling more and more ready to make changes. I think the biggest cha transformation, I, 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 um, biggest change for me is feel, from feeling fearful or feeling guilty that I'm not satisfied with what I am because I'm in a much better position. There's so many people out there, um, but not comparing myself to the wants that I borrow from others, as you shared with me, but knowing that I can do something, I can start with how I smile. I can start with what I do that afternoon, making time, not missing another family appointment because of work and making that time to do something and be ready to do it when the opportunity comes. That's the biggest thing for me. Great. One of the things that you mentioned, if you remember, is that uh, the a lot of your work requires uh, management at, uh, of budgets and KPIs and so on, and the dollars and cents don't interest you at all. But what we really like to do is to work with people and see how it impacts, for example, the children with whom uh, those processes that you're working on is applied. So you're right. Uh, at the end of the day, that is why I call it uh, polarities. There is always a certain want and there is a certain need. You need uh, to exist, you need money, you need some position. At the same time, you have some great needs. Those needs mm -hmm. may be your love of nature and so on and so forth. So traditionally, the way that has always looked at is move to your needs, it'll make you tremendously happy. But none of us is in that position. We are not in a position to say, oh, I take off my clothes and I walk into the sunset. It's not going to happen. We are going to be where we are and we need to make ourselves practically, pragmatically, comfortable with what we do, but at the same time, work towards this deep inner need that is surfacing all the time that we are unconscious of. So that is what this process makes you conscious about. Elaine mentioned about uh, the, the, what is it, something about behavioral needs. Yes, the behavioral needs come from uh, an understanding of what that code is, what that prarabdha is, what is the joyful index is, what is that real need for you, the purpose, etc. And if you really look at something like DILT and so on, neurological models and things like that, they don't really get you there. Cognitively, yes, there is an understanding. But if you go experientially back into what you have felt at a point in time and then you work towards this, it adds a tremendous lot more and you are able to figure out a lot more clearly as to what you're looking for. Somebody mentioned about Master Key. Yes, it's an absolutely amazing book. Um, Charles Hannon, it was written about 100 years ago. Uh, he had tremendous amount of knowledge about various other religions. He talks about the Upanishads, the Dhammapada. He talks about, of course, a lot about the Bible. And, and I found so much that came from the Bible, which was so much that was in common with what was in Upanishads. Uh, whether it was energy, whether it was something about um, somewhere, I don't remember where, Jesus saying that 
you know, if you visualize something as it is that you wish it to be and it'll happen, oh my God, that was just a revelation for me when I read Charles Hamill several years ago. I, these are normally not associated when people talk about Christianity. And this is something tremendously powerful that came to me from Master Key System. So now we will take a big jump, a transformation, and which is something, if possible, I would like you all to work towards today and tomorrow, if possible, and come back on Wednesday to share. And very, you, I don't, I don't want to go through in detail about what it is uh, today. What I found was when I was working with executives and I was working with a number of high potential executives in age groups of about 25 to 35. And uh, when I started asking them about what is it that they want to be and everything was related to the next three years, maybe a maximum five years. And uh, so curiously, I asked them, okay, fine. All that you are talking about is really your career progression, your wealth creation, your status creation, which is what I was caught up at your age. I wanted to make my million dollars. I wanted to do multi-million dollars and I wanted to occupy the corner office. I did that and it didn't stop. It went, I don't know, whatever the creature is, grew and grew and grew. And to such an extent that it completely subsumed me and everything else became subsidiary. My whole life, apart from the fact that I was chasing money and wealth, the money and power, it was meaningless, everything else. And suddenly, out of a trauma, I realized that it doesn't help. And I was very fortunate that I had a spiritual bent of mind. And I went through a Vipassana before that, and I understood suddenly what it was that I needed to do. And so I said, stop the world, I'm getting off. And I went on to a spiritual journey, uh, which, thanks to my wife, I didn't become a monk, gratefully. That would have been the worst thing that I could have done. And I realized there's nobody else outside who can help me. There's no guru out there. There's no Baba out there. There is no master out there. Most of them are hypocrites. I'm sorry to say this. Every single one that I have met himself is searching for something. He hasn't realized it. And he says, I can teach you absolute holy crap. I can't teach you anything. What I'm telling you is some experience that I've had, and you need to learn for yourself. The moment you start putting somebody on a pedestal, you will find they have feet of clay. It's much better that you follow your own feet of clay rather than somebody else's feet of clay. You'll be far better off. So what I started working with them was, I said, great, you know now, like a growth field, what is in the next three years to five years that you can do? And we did that. And now, why don't you look at something 20, 25 years beyond when you're no longer really going to be working? It's something like Stephen Covey says with the end in view. What about the obituary, the eulogy that somebody is going to talk about when you are getting buried or cremated or whatever? What is coming up for you? You don't have to wait till you get buried or cremated or dead. Today, can you think about what it is going to be 25 years from now? What is it that you want to be? What is it that you want to leave behind as a legacy? It's a holistic overview of what you wish to be, completely disconnected with what you are today. It's totally need-based. It's about, it's about a little bit about your wealth and status, but not so much about actively seeking them, obsessed with them, but in terms of, yes, I need to reach that point, and this is where I would like to have a sustenance which will keep me happy in the state where I am today. But many more things, which is about learning, which is about serving other people, which is about mm -hmm. several other things. I'll just show you this. And we called it 65 back because it was something that I sort of developed at a time when I was 65, um, uh, or when I was uh, about late 50s, going towards my 65, uh, 60, uh, 65 age, and what I wanted to be at the age of 65. And my son named it, uh, following some US sport terminology, as 65 back. Okay. So the 65 back is, if you see this, is wealth, assets, career status. These are two of the segments. But there is about health, which we never think about. When we are in our 30s, we are immortal, invincible. What about relationships and family? What about service to community, joyful, 
interests, things that you would like to do just for the heck of it, take a vacation, go somewhere, personal growth and learning, larger environmentals and spirituality. Putting all this together, what is it coming up for you? As a much larger holistic picture, a vision of what you would like to be, the legacy that you want to leave. So this is something, if you start looking at it, when I ask these people to look at it, their first response was, look, you're crazy. I can't even fully comprehend what I'm trying to do in the next three years or five years. And you want me to look at 20, 25 years beyond. How is it going to help me? So I said, what's your fear? No, I can't even think of it. I can't control it. It's too hazy. It's too blurry. So my question to them was, what is it that, is going, that you are able to control even something that happens tomorrow? What is it that you can control even in the next minute or a second, whether you're going to breathe or not? You don't know that. You think you're going to live. You have no idea. You think this is going to happen tomorrow. You have no idea. You think this is going to happen next month. I am the one who is controlling all the uh, threads out there like a puppet. It doesn't work that way. Every one of us knows that, yeah, you try certain things, they work if you're lucky. You try harder, you try smarter, something works. A lot of things don't work. So there is always an element of chance, a probability, possibility in terms of what succeeds, what doesn't succeed. So when you look at a much larger time frame, much longer time frame, you are reducing that probability, that's fine. It's blurry, that's fine. So can you envision something which is hazy, which is long-term, which is distant, but still gives you an idea? Very reluctantly, they went back. There were 10 of them that I was working with at that time. And I got together in a group and started discussing it back with them once. And they came back with things amazing that completely threw me off. They themselves didn't understand. One guy said, you know, I want to go back to the village where my grandfather set up a school. And they were in a multinational selling consumer products. I don't want to be doing this job. I have absolutely no desire. That's what I want to do. I said, hold it. We'll go to the next step. I'd hold this thought. What is it that you would like to be? What is it like you would to serve? Who is that audience, et cetera, et cetera. Something like this business plan as it were, looking at it in a much more cognitive way as well. Another guy said, I always wanted to sing. My grand uncle was this and so on and so forth. Some grana, some form of music, and this is what I want to do. Another person said something else. Out of those 10 people that I worked with, four of them quit their jobs. And as it so happened, each one went to, one went to Stanford, one went to Harvard, one went to Dukes, one went to uh, London School of Business, and they're all doing extraordinarily well in spaces where they train themselves to be. But when I spoke to them a couple of times later, still with that clear vision, this is where I want to be. I'm moving towards that. And that would happen. That's my life's ambition. That's my prarabdha. That's going to happen. There was a person, probably 50 years old, I was working with a couple of years ago. And we went through this. And then she came to me and then she drew a map on a piece of paper. You know, this is what I want to. It's like a school. I want to teach kids. And there will be some farm behind this. There will be some animals here. This, that, whatever it is. I said, fantastic. I don't know what you're talking about, but if that is what you want to do, put it together holistically, there's a way you do. About a year and a half later, she sent me a photograph. I said, Ram, you know, this is where I am. And this was exactly the picture that she drew. And this happened. And so it's not a miracle happening. You are creating your future. You are envisioning that future. And you are embedding it within you. And as you keep thinking about it again and again, this process we will go through later, you will find that it happens. So the step is, when you go and create the 65 back vision, 20 years from now, 25 years from now, if you're 50, maybe 70 years, 
If you are beyond that, maybe 10 years beyond. If you are 40, maybe 65, whatever the period is. Holistically, what is the legacy that you want to leave behind? And then walk back from that age to the age at which you've created your growth wheel, three to five years from now. So you have on one side, I told Bitty, the future, the 65 back, put it on the right side, the present or whatever, the short term, the left, the growth wheel. Look at these two. There would be great gaps, believe you me, if they were the you would be an exception in this world if they were the same. Then you don't have to come to any of this great theory future. You have already achieved what you wanted. You don't need this. But for most of us, there's going to be a gap. And this is the gap we are going to explore in the next session. The gap is created by our beliefs, by our conditioning, by our assumptions, by our value systems. So when you understand these gaps, I would like you to explore for yourself, what is it that is coming up for you when you see growth wheel on one side on the left and this visionary picture on the right? What is it that you experience? What is coming up in you as your sensations? What is it coming up for you as emotions? What is it coming up for your thoughts? Journal them, put them down. And if by that time you, some of you have done that, I would like to invite you to the panel as well to join Betty and then tell me what you're doing. And I'll take you through an extraordinarily, unfortunately, I cannot go to it to the length that I can do otherwise. It take me a day and a half to go through the seven chakras, but very quickly take you through the chakra energization process where each of those which are today blocking you, holding you back from what you want to achieve can be reframed and re-looked at. At the root level, what is called the root chakra, how your desires, which are probably want or egocentric, can be made extremely powerful by becoming ecocentric, by something that you can do over and above what you do for other people. Bill Gates and Warren Buffett are fantastic examples of that. The huge amounts of money that they have made, most of it they have spent for betterment of other people. So that wealth creation by itself has never been a block for them. There are many more people like that. At the next level, we have blocks in terms of fears. Oh, okay, if I do that, what will happen? I lose everything I have. Then what do I have to hold myself for myself for? How do you overcome those fears and have the courage to move ahead? Then how do you handle the residual anxieties which come up for you? Day to day, how do I handle my worries, my anxieties and feel powerful? How do I validate myself at the heart center? How my own belief in myself is sufficient for me to disregard what I may receive from other people as validation or lack of validation? And from there, move into a space at the throat center where I discover my own uniqueness, that I am capable of doing this. No, no matter what, I'll be able to do that. And then moving to this third eye center, which is the center of your prarabdha, yes, I'm in control, but I mean, don't need to control other people by being totally confident, by being present. I do not need to control or make people afraid. I can inspire and influence them. How do I do it? And finally, with all that, you reach a space where you're fully content and fulfilled. There's a process which is extremely powerful. As I'm saying it, it's pure words. It doesn't mean anything, but when you experience it yourself, you will find that starts happening. So one of the things I would like to leave with you also, before I have a short discussion with Betty on this, is one of the points that she mentioned to me and she also briefly mentioned here, she kept repeating about this meditation. She had never done the meditation before and she did that. And one of the things that she told me was, for the first time I learned that breathing has, breathing has to be from deep down from the navel. This is the whole problem with many of us. We breathe shallow, we breathe from our throat, we breathe from our chest at best. So whenever you breathe, you just try and breathe as deep as you can from below your navel. And when you are breathing, make sure by keeping your hands on your 
belly, as it were, that it rises. Because very often we are taught to breathe and we contract ourselves. We stress ourselves by breathing, whereas we should be more comfortable. We should expand, express ourselves by breathing. And that's what should happen in a real uh, breathing society. So, Billy, I just want to un understand from you if there's anything that comes up for me, as I said that, because we didn't really go deep into this. And Nishpita, in the meantime, if there's anything that came up from the chat that I need to address. Um, yeah, somebody- There's said, one question here. Yeah, yeah. Um, someone's asked, they say, I have a confusion, is leaving a legacy coming from need or want? It can come from both, to be honest. If the legacy is purely arising out of what you need to serve other people with what you are, it's like, I don't know how many of you know, there is a community called the Parsis in India. Uh, they originally came from Persia. And when they die, they leave their bodies on the Tower of Silence on top so the vultures can come and eat it. So even the dead body is of value to somebody else. So that they leave behind is not for their need, uh, for their want, it's, it's to fulfill the need of somebody else. So if it arises from fulfilling the need of somebody else, yes, it's a true legacy. But if you're more worried about when I die or when I get to my old age that other people should respect me more or whatever it is, it's about your want. It's your decision, basically. But when you look at the totality of this holistic uh, picture, if you look at it, it's usually highly probable that you will end up with a need picture rather than a want picture. Yes, Bitty, yeah. Um, so what, sorry, could you, what, what was the question? No, the question was that what I said about now moving, I don't know, but we talked about it, we didn't really uh -huh. go through it fully about going to the future, the 65 back and then coming back. Mm -hmm. if, if you did do it, what did you experience so that people can have an idea about what to expect? Um, yeah, so the, the exercise was in going through the, um, Having start my sixty five back is is fuzzy, but um, there the what Ram had asked me to do was in going through the meditation and trying to visualize the chakras, ask myself a couple of questions such as um, what are my fears um, or like what are things I feel the need to control um, how do I, how are the actions how to make it happen and what are things I need to let go um, the when for me, the visualization, I, um, what, what I, the image I held in my head was the PDF, like the chakra, the different colors. I couldn't, as I was going through it, the, the, what I visualized as the energy or the lights going through me, move traveling is always yellow. But um, going through it, what was interesting is through my root center, through the spleen, um, what's it, and it happened like multiple times is I think when I'm around the heart center and I, I think many of you have like shared the chats, like the, the powerful relationships and people that mean the most to you, like those, that's who I thought of. That's their faces. You know, those are the smiles that, you know, when I remember or when I think of them, um, but what is a block for me is when I get up to my chest and my neck, um, I find I'm not quite ready to like move up here, but I, I, there is a little bit of a block how to, whether it's my personality. Um, I don't, it's, I, I hope that um, I mean, I'm happy to share the experience with everybody out there through this webinar, but I think being more vocal, one of the things that I want to do that I'm gonna, I've set as a goal for myself for this week is how to be, more free and offering my feedback at work so that it can, so I'm not one, um, as in my, in, in my position at work, I often, I feel the need to filter myself like many of you are probably hearing me do right now, but being more willing to offer my, um, my opinion and being more honest and instead of being diplomatic at work. So part of my 65 back, the spoke, the, we, the spoke that was easiest for me to do was I visualized myself at 65. I want to be able to take these um, hikes and that means I have to be in good shape. So uh, it's easy to come up with a fitness plan. That was the easiest spoke for me. But um, going through it the next time and noticing where my blocks are and my, 
and being empowered from the light in my chest, but being feeling blocked in my throat and um, feeling the tension <laughs> at my shoulder when I um, think about work. Um, but then remembering to let it go, because one of the, um, the prompts in the audio and one of the things that Ram said is when the, the thoughts come, recognize it, but also be prepared to let it go. You know, some, what are the things to be aware of? And then um, after the meditation, noticing what are the things I'm doing differently? Um, are there choices that I'm trying, uh, that I enjoy making? And what are things that if I don't have control, I have to do it. That's okay too. Um, and having in my, part of my three to five year plan is, yes, I am recognizing that there are things that I can make better and there are changes I want to make in my work life. And that will allow me to to fill in the wheels in my 65 back so and i think this will take me a couple more tries but noticing the um, like my when i meditate going through the process my my hands always feel warm and then they get really clammy and then they feel warm again but i think it's um again it's a very i think empowering feeling for me to feel that yes the universe will help me reach the goals, whether or not um, I, my, uh, sorry, find my, help me find my purpose and that I'm going to try my best to keep going through it until it's better defined for me. And, um, and another thing I do want to say it's powerful for me is to phrase my visual, like what I want to be in a, in the positive. I want to give back to to the world and, and I want to protect our environment instead of I'm sad to see A, B, and C. What are the things that I want to do? What are the things I can do? Um, so that's what I got out of my last assignment that I want to share with everybody. Great, thanks, Betty. I just want to leave this with you since you said that you were getting blocked somewhere near the throat. It's about expression, it's about communication, it's about expressing your uniqueness. So rather than trying to filter anything, don't, just be authentic, but at the same time, what is Carl Rogers calls a congruence in terms of what you think, what you speak, and what you act. But at the same time, unconditional positive regard to the other person. So whatever you say is going to land well, that the impact of what your intent is, is in alignment. That's extremely important. And, and for the rest of you, do not worry too much about the chakras, the colors, the visualization, etc. Those are purely, rep I, I just took that picture from the internet and uh, who the hell knows what the colors are, to be honest with you. I mean, each one has its own, her own interpretation. Most of them are wrong. Um, you might find that your heart chakra is completely coming up with a different color than any of these people say. You don't have to align with that. It's what comes up for you that is important. So what I want to do at this point in time, so a couple of things I just want to leave with you. Yeah, these, uh, whatever, the joyful index or the feel-good index, and then moving to the Ikigai and the growth wheel, and then creating the 65 back, coming back to the same time frame as the growth wheel. Look at them side by side, right and left, and then see what the gaps arising are, arising out of it, what are the sensations, what are the emotions, what are the thoughts that are coming up for you, then we will work on it in the next session. And if a couple of you would like to be here, you would like to, have, if you had experienced it already, and if you want to do something with it, come and join us. We are going to have, again, short of time. Uh, we're going to do at least two major exercises next week, uh, the, the next session on Wednesday. But today, what I wanted to do was take you through a meditation with your permission, which is not something that I do always. Uh, it's uh, not many people do this particular meditation. It has multiple uh, outcomes. One is it's about connecting you with the elements that you're made of, which are the earth, water, fire, air, and space. Those are the five elements that we are, that we are constituted with, and which also frightens us. Even though we are of the earth, we are frightened of being buried. Even though we are of water, we are frightened of being drowned. Even though we are of fire, we are frightened of being cremated, and so on and so forth. So this meditation is something which could take you through in a very, very simple way in terms of what your natural elements are and how do you exist with that. And to a large extent, this will also help you 
clear some primal primordial fears. And uh, the video of this would be available to you. Mark Nishmita would try and reach it to you by say in about an hour, hour and a half after the session. So if any of them practice it, it is something that could help you in future as well. Some of them who have experienced this have felt good about it. So I'll start with the meditation. At the end of the meditation, I will not be entertaining any questions, any discussions, nor do I want you to do anything. Just be, stay where you are at the end of that meditative period, which might end maybe 15 minutes or 20 minutes from now, I have no idea. And at that time, stay in that space for five, 10 minutes if you can. And just be mindless. Just disengage from your thoughts. So watch them as if they are clouds in the sky. Okay. So let me start the meditation. And Betty, if you want to mute yourself, that's fine. Um, so there will be no further conversation. Yeah, I would like all of you, wherever you are, to sit comfortably. If you are in a chair, firmly place your feet on the ground. Rest yourself comfortably at the back and put your hands on your lap or on the armrest or wherever you are and keep these three fingers together. They are kind of sitting anchors. They're not really any kind of a mudra with any special meaning. If you're on the floor, sure, sit on the floor, do the same thing. Most important is keep your back, spine, neck, and head in one line, aligned, erect. Do not slouch forward, do not slouch backward, and close your eyes and be awake. It is good to meditate while sleeping, but it's bad to sleep while meditating. So just keep your eyes closed. Put a smile on your lips, your feet firmly on the floor, with your fingers together, hands on your lap. Take a deep breath, as deep as you can, from your navel and beard below. Hold it as long as you're comfortable. Exhale as completely as you can and hold. Just repeat this. Inhale deeply from below the navel. Watch or feel your belly rise. Hold as much as you can comfortably. Exhale completely and hold. And as you inhale, feel that you are breathing in the energy of the universe. And as you hold, that energy is spreading through every part of your body tips of your fingers, to your toes. And as you exhale, you allow yourself to expand beyond this mind and body into the universal energy beyond. And as you hold, you become one with that universal energy. You are one with that energy. Just become one with that energy. Keep breathing, inhaling deeply, holding, exhaling deeply, and holding. Please focus on your root chakra, which is a point where your thighs meet your trunk, the perineum point, the lowest point of your spine. This is a space of your internal energy where the Kundalini is stored. And this is connected to the earth. It's about your basic desires. It's about your prarabdha. It is about where you wish to be, what your needs are. I would like you to visualize that as you are walking on a pathway which is just soil, which is not tarmac, concrete, in a rural area, in a field, wherever you are, the earth is opening up in front of you and you're walking into the earth, unafraid, not knowing. You go deeper and deeper. It is dark, but it's inviting, it's comforting. It's after all what you're made of. It's your mother, some other earth, nurturing. Without the earth, nothing will exist. You are seeded by this earth, be comfortable. Go deeper and deeper and deeper. You don't know how far deep you have gone. You are covered on all sides by the earth. You're buried, and yet 
You are alive, you are breathing. And feel yourself becoming part of that earth. You are back to where you started from. Earth to earth, as it were. You are completely comfortable being that. The body, the mind, the matter has once again gone into that elemental form of the earth that you came from, the earth that you are part of, the earth that your root center is. Just be comfortable. Feel very comfortable being in the space of this earth, even though you are buried, you don't know how deep, you don't know where, all that you know is it's darkness, but it's wonderful, nurturing, caring, energizing darkness. Move forward, more deeper, deeper. And as you go deeper and deeper, suddenly you find you are wet, you are in water. Just continue to move. Continue to float, whether you know swimming or not, don't worry about it. The water is your element. 85% of you is just water. You are water. Become one with that water. Become like a fish. You are breathing in that water, comfortable, with absolutely no fear. There is some distant light which you can see from the darkness that you have moved into. And you are expanding, you are floating, you are free. You feel yourself growing bigger and bigger and bigger. The bigger that you are, the easier you find it to float. Allow yourself to float completely, expand completely. Move forward. Keep going, keep going, keep going. You are in this beautiful elemental space of water. You experience the nurturing of the earth, now you are experiencing the enveloping nurturing of water. Swim, move, float forward. And as you are moving forward, you feel more light and you feel warmth and you feel heat. And you are entering a zone of fire. And it's not a fire that burns you, it's a fire that energizes you. As you go into the fire, the elemental fire of which you are made of, that fire envelops you. It recreates you, it re-energizes you, it refreshes you. Allow yourself to become part of the fire. Recognize that it's your element, just like the earth and the water are. And in the fire, you are being yourself. Your body and mind do not matter anymore, but your energy is the same energy as the fire. Recognize that. Respect that. And be in the fire. Be unafraid. Feel all the inner tensions, the inner worries consumed by that fire. All the unconscious negative memories that you have stored all your life in the cellular system of your body and brain and mind, allow them to be consumed by that fire. So you are clean, You are a white boat, you are a tabla rasa. From this beautiful space of having through, having gone through the earth, the water and the fire, move beyond as you walk beyond the fire. You suddenly find yourself floating and flying in air, 
free as a bird. Another element that you're part of. Soaring higher and higher and higher. Reaching heights that you've never been before. Allow yourself to move up, soar, to reach the potential that you are capable of, the infinite possibilities that define you. With no fear that normally you cannot fly, but you are flying now without worrying about whether you can fly higher and higher and higher. Yes, you can. Just keep flying. Become one with the air. Allow that air to lift you, lift you as much as you wish it to be. Keep moving forward, keep moving upwards. You've been through the earth, the water and the fire elements. Now you are in the air element. Allow that air element now to lift you further and further and further. The air element is the stuff that your heart center is made of. You are expanding, you are connecting with everything around you, the elements, the creatures, the universe, everything around you. You are expanding in compassion, you are expanding in love, you are expanding in relationship. Just allow yourself to soar. And as you move higher and higher, you enter this space. It's again darkness, it's a different darkness. It's a darkness of pure energy. That's the highest level of energy that you can reach. The space is where your crown center energy is, the Sahasrara is, where you are an integrated state with your own spirit, with your own energy. Just be comfortable that you are in the space of energy where you are one with the universal energy. You are in a state of constant expansion as a universe is. It's never ending. You're expanding infinitely. You are expanding in your potential, infinite possibilities. Allow yourself to expand more and more and more. Stay in this space, this beautiful space. You have moved through the chakras, from the root chakra to the crown center, the Sahasrara. Just focus your attention on your heart center. Keep expanding. Move beyond the room that you are in. Move beyond the city that you are in. Move beyond the country that you are in, in energy. You can see the entire earth and the oceans and the land. Move beyond that. You are moving into space where you are now. You can see the other planets. You are beyond the solar system. You can see the galaxies. Move beyond them. You move into the universe and the multiverses. Keep expanding, keep expanding. Staying in your heart center, focused on your heart center, breathing in, holding, out, holding. Continue this process. Just be there. Just be there. You're going deeper and deeper into your own inner self at the same time expanding into this universe with your feet firmly on the floor, with your eyes closed, with your fingers coming together in a circle. Any time in future that you will recreate this experience, all that you have to do is to sit in this posture and put your fingers together. It will act as a kinesthetic anchor and bring you back into this experience immediately. So you can take off from wherever you left at any point in time. Go deeper and deeper. Stay in the space of Anahata. Practice this a few more times with deep breathing, inhaling, holding, exhaling and holding. 
same exercise of going through the elements, earth, water, fire, air, and space, and expansion. And then look at creating your joyful moments, your sweet success spot, your growth wheel, your 65 pack, comparing them together, finding out what the gaps are, and what is it that is coming up for you as emotions, sensations, thoughts, so that you can bring them up, journal on them, and we take it to the next step, how we can help cleanse every one of them. A lot may have got cleansed even during this process of meditation, but we'll go deeper and deeper into this space. Slowly, gently, open your eyes, but stay in the space of contemplation, of peace. Stay where you are to the extent you can for the next five or 10 minutes if you can in this state of meditation. We see you again on Wednesday. Thank you.